everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for attending today, Watershed Wednesdays. I'd like to welcome everybody to week three of 2022 Watershed Wednesday series. I am Lydia Brinkley, the Riparian Buffer Coordinator for the Upper Susquehanna Coalition. Watershed Wednesdays are hosted by the USC and the Otsego County Conservation Association. These weekly sessions are taking the place of the Upper Susquehanna Watershed Forum for 2022. We will be holding these sessions every Wednesday through November and the full schedule is posted on our website and on Facebook, so you can find it there. You can also sign up for email announcements on our website under the Watershed Wednesdays tab. These sessions are recorded and can be accessed on our USC website at a later date. To get things started today, our presenter is Brian Steinmuller. Brian is the Assistant Director of the Division of Lands, Land and Water Resources and the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee otherwise known as the State Committee of the New York State Department of Ag and Markets, a position that he has held since 2009. As the Assistant Director, Brian is responsible for the daily operations of the State Committee, whose statutory responsibility is to guide, coordinate, and network the state's 58 county soil and water conservation districts. Today, Brian is going to be presenting on the Agricultural Environmental Management Framework, Associated Cost Share Programs Administered by the, by the State Committee, and the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act as it relates to agriculture and forest strategies. Thank you, Brian, for presenting today. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Liddy. Thank you um, to the Upper Susquehanna Coalition and, and uh, OCCA for, for hosting me today. Um, that was a great introduction, so I get to skip that part from myself. Thank you, and uh, we'll get right into it. Okay, so um, as already mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the the current Soil and Water Conservation Committee and Ag and Markets initiatives, as well as some Soil and Water Conservation District work. I'm um, going to also talk about um, the state in initiatives, such as the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, otherwise known as the CLCPA, and sometimes known as the Climate Act. I might use those terms interchangeably. And also I'm gonna add a little bit about federal initiatives, specifically the Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities, um, which is an opportunity that came about, um, you know, after we had planned this session, but I thought it was very pertinent to today's discussion. Okay. Um, first and foremost, um, as, as Lydia mentioned, the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee uh, works to advance the mission and the goals objectives of county soil and water conservation districts um, by way of networking, by way of providing education and training opportunities, and just overall support for our conservation districts. So I'd like to talk a little bit about districts here today. Hopefully most of you are very familiar, um, but soil and water conservation districts are natural resource entities who implement conservation programs at the county level and often in the watershed level, such as the uh, Susquehanna Coalition of Conservation Districts. There are 58 districts in New York State. Um, there are 62 counties and 58 districts. Um, all the land mass in New York are, are covered with a conservation district, including the five boroughs of New York City that combine into one, hence the 58 conservation districts. They are authorized under state law. Um, they are non-regulatory, implementation-based, partnership driven and watershed focused. Uh, very briefly, um, uh, accomplishments for 2021 as, uh, as indicated or, or, or seen in the 2021 annual report, uh, conservation districts accomplished 328 acres of riparian buffers implemented, 7,500 acres under the Ag Non Point Source uh, program of cover crops implemented, 128 acres of wet wetland created, 77 forest management plans developed for nearly 30,000 acres of forest land. Nearly 500,000 tree, tree and shrub seedlings were sold for conservation purposes to the general public. And over $2.9 uh, $2 million was invested to manage invasive species. Um, that just scratches the surface of the accomplishments of districts in 2021. Please uh, follow the link there below um, for the complete end report. Okay. And talk a little bit about the AIM framework, Agricultural Environmental Management Framework for New York State. And the AIM framework is a consistent um, framework, it has been for over 20 years, that really focuses our agricultural conservation efforts. Um, this is a, a partnership 
uh, uh, effort uh, between our conservation districts, local conservation professionals and farmers. And uh, the objective of, of AIM is to help farmers to um, implement agricultural best management practices, um, be, become more environmentally sustainable, and when so doing, also improve the economic viability of the farms. All farms and all commodities are eligible. Um, this works within the resources of each farm. It's voluntary and incentive-based, watershed focused, and as I mentioned, locally, delivered, locally led and delivered by soil and water conservation districts and partners. It follows a five-tiered approach, which is a, a science-based and also confidential. Um, tier one is an inventory of the basic farm information and interests of the farm. Tier two assesses the existing stewardship and environmental risks of the farm. Tier three develops conservation plans to address those higher risks. Tier four implements best management practice systems, um, uh, implementing the, the, the plan um, to, to lead to you know, higher level of environmental management. And tier five kind of brings it full circle by evaluating the outcomes and, and, and also um, allowing districts to update inventories, assessments, and plans as the farm uh, goes along. Um, AIM is the key framework for the state's agricultural conservation initiatives. Um, AIM-related uh, technical assistance and cost share programs um, uh, uh, help achieve the, the, the goals of, of nine element watershed management plans, TMDL planning, harmful algal, algal bloom plans. Um, AIM is also the uh, core uh, framework for the New York State Grown and Certified Program. Um, AIM also is the, the, the core uh, framework, the planning framework for the DEC CAFO permit program. And most recently, also very heavily related to the Climate Action Council draft scoping plan related to agriculture and forestry. Um, again, the core concepts that open to all farmers, voluntary incentive based, um, as well as science based, watershed focused. Um, it's a, adaptive to future priorities as well, um, such as those um, priorities and goals related to climate change, um, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, as well as um, industry-led initiatives, such as the Dairy Net Zero Initiative and other sustainability goals. And under the Agri-Environmental Management or AIM framework, um, is the Agnon Point Source Water Pollution uh, uh, Abatement and Control Program, otherwise known as Agnon Point Source. Uh, this program was created in 1993, uh, where the first round of Agnon Point Source awarded it was in 1994 for $340,000. Um, and you know, fast forward to today, where $15 million was awarded under round 26 of the program, um, where another $13 million is available for projects in round 27. Approximately $210 million has been awarded through the Agnon Point Source pro Program since its beginning. Um, core to the Agnon Point Program is water quality protection, uh, with the goals and objectives to reduce and or prevent the non-point source contribution for ag from agricultural activities in watersheds across the state. As I mentioned before, this utilizes the AIM framework and also locally led and delivered by soil and water conservation districts, farm partners, and other uh, technical assistance providers locally. Types of projects um, implemented under this program include um, manure storage for nutrient management, uh, grazing, pasture management projects, as well as riparian forest buffers for water quality protection, um, just to name a few. The Climate Resilient Farming Program. Also under the AIM framework, the Climate Resilient Farming Program um, established in 2015 his main goal is to help our agricultural producers reduce emissions from their farms, uh, increase sequestration capacity in our forests and soils um, owned and operated by, by our farmers, and also to increase the resiliency and the adaptation potential for our farms statewide. Since 2015, about $20 million was awarded uh, to 270 farms with an estimated emission reduction of 388,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Um, we implement this program under three tracks. The first, uh, methane management uh, by way of manure storage cover and, and flare system. So why manure storage cover and flare? 
uh, as we cover as as we cover these storages, we're actually capturing the methane that would be created um, um, from the storage itself, and redirecting that methane into a flare system or into a system for renewable energy, such as electricity or renewable natural gas. Um, while we are covering these storages, we're also helping farmers to be more resilient to our changing climate by avoiding the millions of gallons of rainwater that would otherwise fall into these open storages. Um, that has a, a supplemental benefit of also reducing the amount of fossil fuel emissions by way of getting that, uh, that, 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 that manure out on the fields. We're avoiding all that rainwater from having to be hauled out in the field. Uh, track two is really about adaptation and resiliency. This is our riparian floodplain and, and water management track. Um, here under track two, we are helping our farms to prepare for and to address already experienced and anticipated uh, um, impacts of extreme weather, extreme precipitation. Um, too much rain uh, all at once when it's not able to be soaked in or not needed, and then not enough rain in between those storms where we have to um, uh, really um, uh, address irrigation capacity for, for our farmland. Uh, specifically our specialty crop industries. So both droughts and floods are uh, the types of uh, impacts that we're, we're helping our farms to address under track two. And track three, Healthy Soils NY. Um, this is a track where we really promote and encourage the adoption of, of soil health management practices, primarily cover crops, but also reduced tillage and other systems that keep a living root in the soil for as much of the year as possible. Um, Track three helps promote that. Of course, with the promotion of soil health, we have a multiple benefits of both reducing emissions, increasing our, our, our carbon sequestration capacity in our soils, and also helping our farmland to be more resilient um, to extreme weather events, as higher organic matter in our soils also has the ability to um, absorb and capture more rainwater and keep it there for a longer period of time. Um, round six was actually just awarded last week during Climate Week, September 22nd, uh, where we awarded an additional $7.9 million. The program impact of CRF, the Climate Resilient Farming Program, again, from 2015 to 2022, um, from our beginning to the anticipated impact of our current round of funding that was just awarded, um, about 388000 I'm sorry, almost 390,000 um, metric tons of CO2 equivalent, where you can see most of the emission reductions comes from our track one of methane. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute, why that is so important to meeting our state's climate goals. And that was a good segue to the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, otherwise known as the CLCPA and Climate Act. And what is the CLCPA? Um, New York State enacted the CLCPA in 2019, and it went into effect January 1st of 2020. The statute sets achievements of a net zero economy by 2050 as a goal, requiring an 85% reduction in emissions while allowing for sequestration of up to 15% of emissions. Um, all of these percentages are based on a 1990 baseline. The statute also sets an interim emission goal, or I should say target, of no more than 60% of 1990 levels. Um, by 2030. That is a 40% reduction. The law also requires DEC to promulgate a regulation to set those 60% and 15% emissions, which DEC has done in 2021. And although the Climate Act does not detail an emission reduction plan per se, it envisions an overall strategy of beneficial electrification of the entire New York State economy, empowering that efficient electrified economy with clean sources of power, including 100% zero carbon electricity by 2040 and investments in storage to balance the intermittency inherent to wind, water, solar panel power. Um, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act also set up the Climate Action Council. Climate Action Council is also determining right now the, the fate and, and, and use of low carbon fuels in addition to electrification for the hard to electrify economies in New York State for strategic and limited use. The CLCPA further requires that investments in disadvantaged communities be prioritized and that support be provided to individuals and communities currently dependent on fossil fuel industries. 
as I mentioned before, um, uh, the CLCPA um, sets out um, an emissions baseline, and emissions under the CLCPA are counted differently than in some other jurisdictions, um, primarily for methane and nitrous oxide. Um, the CLCPA requires that we account for these emissions using a 20-year global warming potential. And what does that mean? That means that for methane, that increases the potency of, of those emissions in the atmosphere from approximately 34 to 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, nitrous oxide stays relatively the same when compared from a 100-year to a 20-year global warming potential. But for methane, as I mentioned, um, there's a much more... Um, uh, um, there's, a, there's a much higher emission factor. So that means um, sources of methane really need to be prioritized under the CLCPA. Of course, um, that includes the um, sources um, from agriculture, uh, such as manure storages and also through um, animal feeding. Of course, the waste sector and, and other sectors, such as the natural gas sector, really have to prioritize and control for methane. Um, as required by the Climate Act, and as I mentioned, um, DEC issued an emissions report at the end of 2021, and you really can see the enormity of the challenge that we face here, illustrated by the bar graph on the right, um, reducing the state's emissions from about 375 million metric tons to about 61 million metric tons over the next 30 years. The um, circular graph on the left uh, indicates the relative proportions represented by our major emissions sectors in New York State. Um, and you can see there agriculture is about, well, it's about 6% of the total emissions in New York State, relatively small uh, percentage of emissions, but also very important portion of, of the New York State emissions and also in meeting the overall goal of climate um, or carbon neutrality by 2050. So under the Climate Action Council's draft scoping plan, um, there is uh, strategies for both agriculture and forestry and how we're going to reduce emissions and also increase sequestration capacity. Uh, both ag and forestry sectors were combined under one panel to inform uh, that chapter. That panel met a number of times from 2020 to 2021 um, to um, uh, the point where we would have a draft um, chapter uh, in, in regards to how we were going to meet these emission reductions. Um, two key themes of the panel really came out right from the very beginning. We need to reduce agricultural emissions, and we also need to increase sequestration capacity in our forests and on our farms. I won't read through all of this here, but um, within each of the, the, the sector chapters in the draft scoping plan, there is a vision for those sectors by both 2030 and 2050. As you can see, we also have an enormous task ahead to dramatically lower agricultural emissions, primarily methane, nitrous oxide, while also increasing our sequestration capacity to offset what would be about 60 million metric tons of emissions by 2050. So just um, um, a little bit more detail on how we wanna go about reducing agricultural emissions. It really, it really relies on the strong framework and the head start that we already have through the AIM program, our climate resilient farming program, district-led initiatives, and um, um, you know, support for those initiatives, such as nutrient management. To continue to reduce nitrous oxide emissions on our croplands, we wanna continue nu nutrient management. We know that there are um, significant co-benefits to water quality, as nutrient management um, also um, prevents um, um, phosphorus and nitrogen uh, running off into our watersheds. Um, so really looking at expanding nutrient management on all crop fields, hay fields, pastures, orchards, vineyards, and other agricultural lands receiving nutrients. Um, alternative manure management. We wanna to continue to um, uh, reduce methane emissions by implementing practices that are tailored to each farm, such as cover and flare systems, as I mentioned before, anaerobic digestion systems, and others that can capture methane or prevent methane from occurring upstream uh, in that manure management strategy. Precision feed, forage, and herd management, reducing methane emissions from um, uh, precision uh, from animal feeding through that uh, use of precision feed and forage herd management. So really here we're, we're again, um, trying to uh, continue to achieve uh, desired ruminant growth and lactation goals for our um, animal agricultural industry in New York, 
Um, and also this strategy acknowledges that additional methane emission reduction may be realized from feed additives that are under development at this time and if deemed safe and scalable in the future. Broadly, increasing sequestration in our forests and on our farms, first off, we want to keep those forests and farms in place. We want to avoid the conversion of forests and farmland in New York State, and that will help us to maintain um, a lower emission um, um, uh, um, status for agricultural land so that we can continue to reduce those emissions and also increase our sequestration capacity over time. Soil health. Um, we want to continue to advance soil health practices in New York State, um, and that will help us to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sequestration. The word adoption there is underlined, as we know that um, soil health practices can be intermittent, they can be seasonal. We want to make sure that those practices are being um, implemented and adopted in the long run. Agroforestry, simply put, we want to add trees in the agriculture production areas wherever possible. That could include repairing forest buffers as the Susquehanna Coalition certainly are leading the state um, in that implementation of those buffers, but also could include civil pasturing, alley cropping, and other types of um, nut orchards and, and um, tree agriculture. Forest management. We know that uh, through improved forest management, we can increase the sequestration capacity in our existing forests. Um, and where we have um, um, areas of underutilized agricultural lands or other areas of lands across the state um, that could be reforested or afforested, um, we want to assist in that area too. So that's tree planting focused on those underutilized lands and in order to increase tree density for understocked forests. And finally, the climate focused bioeconomy. This is the portion of the economy that produces sustainable um, agriculture and forestry based feedstocks rather than fossil fuel based feedstocks to produce the products that we all um, rely on, the products that we need, um, such as bioplastics and of course energy uh, related um, um, needs as well. And um, this will also help us to increase the economies for both uh, agriculture and, and, and forestry sectors in, in New York State. And I know I'm running short on time, so just want to just mention here as well that um, the Climate Action Council and the draft scoping plan. Um, uh, so the Climate Action Council continues to meet through the end of this year to deliberate on some of the key um, facets of the draft scoping plan. Um, by law, the scoping plan has got to be finalized by January of 2023. So we have our work cut out for us. So public feedback and further analysis is informing the forthcoming final scoping plan. And again, the, the scoping plan is multi-sectoral. As I mentioned, it's holistic and grounded in um, scenarios uh, for emission reductions and meeting our ambitious targets. It's also informed by recommendations from all the advisory panels, as well as the Climate Justice Working Group and the Just Transition Working Group. And finally, uh, federal initiatives. Um, USDA has really stepped up to um, identify the types of programs that they've been administering for a long time that have got climate uh, benefits, that have got um, resiliency and adaptation benefits, just as we have here in New York State. And most recently, um, USDA has made funding available to states, to not-for-profits, to other entities across the country to really um, um, catalyze this work to um, um, advance this work uh, in, 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 in ways that only um, the federal government and the support that they have can really do. So um, recently they announced the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities Grant Program. Um, New York State uh, with DEC and Ag and Markets as the lead um, did apply for this program really to implement the scoping plan to further advance our aim and our climate resilient farming programs, all the great work districts are doing. And just a couple of week, weeks ago, we were informed that we did receive um, an award. Um, out of $2.8 billion, uh, 70 projects were awarded. I believe there was um, uh, over 400 applications or so forth for this particular funding round. So we're very lucky to be awarded $60 million to advance the strategies that I just talked about, specifically how we can continue to advance climate smart dairy practices, as well as climate smart innovations and practices for agroforestry, silvopasturing, as well as urban agriculture. 
and how we can continue to advance and adapt soil health practices across specialty crops, field crops, and all commodity crops in New York State. As I mentioned, this was also a forestry grant. So our partners at DEC are going to be um, looking to advance um, core forestry programs such as Regenerate New York, their 480A uh, forest management program and many others. Um, so stay tuned. Um, I know this will be a lot more work and a lot more um, funding and resources being brought to bear on the issues here in New York State. So we're very excited to be a recipient of this. And obviously, and of course, um, you know, we couldn't have done it and, and couldn't have proposed this project without the full support of our conservation districts and, and really um, looking at our conservation districts and conservation partners in New York State for advancing the objectives and goals under this program. And with that, I did not leave a lot of time for questions. My apologies, but uh, there was a lot to, to get through here. But um, um, I think there's a few more minutes left. I just want to say thank you again. And certainly, if there are any questions or um, anything I can elaborate on, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, Brian. Really appreciate that. Um, and nice, nice overview. There are questions. Um, we're going to start at the top. Uh, this one def came up during early earlier discussion on the Climate Act. Uh, comment and question is this pipe dreams for farms. How are you going to implement? Is it a law that makes farmers do what is proposed? Uh, great, great, great question. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're really going to be relying on, on the core um, AIM framework, the, the work that we've um, been establishing and, and implementing here in New York State for quite some time. Um, our strategies really do rely on that approach, a voluntary incentive-based approach rather than a strict regulatory one. Um, there's a lot of momentum already here in New York State, but there's a ton of work that needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, in order to reduce our emissions um, uh, further, um, it's going to also take some out-of-the-box thinking as well. More research and development uh, in approaches that we, you know, couldn't even think of or dream of now. But also what's really important and, and necessary, and, and, I, and I probably um, you know, didn't provide enough detail, is we also have to um, do a better job of accounting for our benefits. We have to do a better job of, of modeling and measuring the types of emission reductions that are necessary, and also sequestration uh, increases that are necessary to meet these CLCPA targets for national and working lands for agriculture and forestry. Um, so there's an enormous task ahead. It's maybe not as easy um, to track our emission reductions, converting a fossil fuel engine to an electric car, for example. So um, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of work ahead, as I mentioned, and you know, really reliant on the core framework that we've established and advancing that framework um, over time. Good, thanks. Uh, second, I'm gonna put these two together because this is about some of the strategies. Um, I don't see compost barns or other alternatives and also uh, about advanced perennial sod systems. Yeah, um, so, so there's a lot of detail in the scoping plan that I left out of this presentation, of course, and even more detail in how we implement the scoping plan. The alternative manure management um, strategies um, could uh, encompass those types of, of practice systems. So it's not just about retrofitting the uh, liquid manure storages that we currently have in the landscape for nutrient management and water quality, but it's also about um, being able to plan and implement practice systems that prevent that methane from the storage of, of manure and other agricultural wastes. So that could include bedded pack systems, other dry stack manure systems, even um, uh, intensively managed rotational grazing systems. Um, you know, in order to get you know some some of that uh, that manure out from under the barn and, and deposited by by the animals themselves. Um, so it really is uh, um, a case by case, farm by farm, and. Uh, like I mentioned before, our real task ahead is also going to be how do we actually measure the impact of those various manure storage and manure management systems. Okay, great. Um, and, and I know just perennials, perennials as well. Oh, sorry. Um, also are included in a number of the strategies, including soil health, certainly agroforestry, and nutrient management. You know, so anytime we can we can um, um, convert row crops, annual crops to a perennial forage or perennial type system we know we have multiple uh, benefits, water quality, carbon sequestration, reduced nutrient needs, all of the above. Okay, good, um, thank you. Um, is New York State going to want to reduce cow numbers and animal agriculture to meet its climate goals? So 
the the strategy scoping plan, as I mentioned before, really relying on voluntary incentive based approaches, um, relying on continuing the good work that our farmers are doing. Um, so in the strategies themselves, no, we, we, we did not talk about that the need to reduce those animal numbers um, where, you know, it's really about the management of the livestock management of the manure generated by the livestock uh, in, in ways that we could accomplish our targets. Okay. Great, and we have one more. Brian, when do you think the rollout of the Climate Smart Commodities Program will begin? Yeah, great question. Um, so we're working with USDA uh, and we'll be having meetings with them on uh, finalizing the scope of, of, of that program. Um, so I, I think there will be a lot more information out uh, by the first of the year and how we're gonna be rolling this out. Really rolling it out through our existing core programs, as I mentioned here as well as um, some other uh, innovative ideas and ways to incentivize adoption of practices. So stay tuned, but um, this fall we'll be working with USDA on the scope and then moving forward um, after the first year. Well, very good, thank you. We have no more questions and it is just after 10. For everybody, I wanna remind you that um, this is being recorded and will be posted um, once we get it ready. And uh, thank you, Brian, so much for your time and expertise. And next week, um, oh gosh, I don't I don't have that handy. Um, what next week's uh, presentation is. Not sure if Lydia, if you know, I don't remember, but. Uh, I, I also do not have that, um, <laughs> but I, I just one second. It looks like we have uh, oh. Kevin Brown again, uh, cover crops. Oh, yep. And the challenges with them. Yes, very good. So tune in next week, same time, same place. Thank you. Thanks, thank Brian. You all. Thank you very much, Brian. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.